So let's start uh, with the assessment of damages because this trade war has been going on for some time now and uh, it has caused a lot of difficulties. Uh, the, the head of the IMF was saying that growth is going to, GDP growth is slowing down but commercial growth is slowing down. So uh, Mr. Mark, what, what, are, what do you see as the first damages of this trade war already? And we'll go back to the reasons afterwards. Yes, uh, the damages are uh, at the beginning, it looks like very insignificant. Mm -hmm. But uh, as time goes by, especially by the uh, view of economists, uh, this negative uh, effect of cross uh, tariff retaliations uh, is spreading. Uh, rapidly into the whole, you know, of the U.S. economy. Of, of course, it's China also. So more direct uh, damages between U.S. And, and, and China. I think in the case of uh, uh, China, of course, the uh, exporters, producers of export items which are heading to the United States are hurt, most hurt. Uh, according to my uh, simple calculation, uh, out of total China's uh, export, 19%. Uh, going to United States. It's not a small number. Mm -hmm. So uh, the exporters are hurt very much. These exporters include not only Chinese but also other foreign companies too. In the case of the uh, United States, as Marcus uh, uh, pointed out, uh, of course the uh, consumers and the users of uh, goods imported from China mm -hmm. and also uh, U.S. farmers who are exporting agricultural product to, uh, to, uh, in, uh, to China. Story, yeah. So in terms of some small numbers, uh, out of total U.S. imports, 22%, almost 22% are coming from China. It's, it's a big number. So mm -hmm. that's why I'm saying consumers and producers are hurting. And also uh, the farmers, uh, I think I heard also 17% of uh, total agricultural export of U.S. is going to China. So overall, these two countries are, uh, we know that clearly uh, they, are, they are hurting. And these days, many researchers are analyzing uh, more specific uh, uh, re results. And the Korea, you know, like, uh, for example, Korea, uh, Dr. Sagong mentioned that this morning, but uh, China and United States is Korea's number one and number two trading partner. So Korea is caught uh, by these yeah, two uh, yeah. big uh, giants. And uh, according to the WTO report, uh, for uh, first seven months from January to July this year, Korea's export reduced by almost 9%, 8.6%, something mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. This is the uh, worst uh, record Good. among top 10 world exporting mm -hmm. countries. So we are really hurt. Yes. And what about uh, our export to China? Similar period, we lost uh, almost 17% uh, uh, reduction compared to the uh, same period of uh, mm -hmm. Uh, previous year. So Korea is really hurt. And also, if you look at the details, uh, mostly uh, the parts and components and equipment producers who are exporting to China, they are, they are really hurt because our exports, out of our export, almost 79% are those kind of items. Oh. So I can give you some, some example of damages. Yeah, that's yeah. pretty impressive figures. This morning, around the round table, you were moderating, uh, Gabriel. Uh, one of the um, consequences was also uh, on FDI, direct investments. Uh, can you tell us, or whoever wants to, uh, about the effect that trade war has on that because of the uncertainty it creates? Exactly. So, I mean, if you look at the, the big macroeconomic aggregates, uh, investment is by far the most volatile, and it reacts most uh, to news or to you know, changed information and also to uncertainty. Mm -hmm. You can postpone investment, but you can't postpone consumption so much when people need to eat and so on. And so this procrastination uh, is what, uh, what, what matters so much now, as uh, uh, Olivier Blanchard explained this mm -hmm. morning. Um, uh, that you know, if you look at uh, Korea, another uh, you know, striking feature of the Korean economy right now is how much investment is suffering. So it's been negative for the last quarters, I think three, four quarters already, uh, and, and that re simply reflects the fact that if you don't know what the markets are in the future, whether there are tariffs or no tariffs, uh, w what can you do as an as a entrepreneur? You can only wait. Mm -hmm. What you can also do, and th that's the counter argument, is, and that is valid, for example, for the United States, they say if there is a large net importing market like the United States, and you face as an exporter from Europe, you face uncertainty about the market access conditions, about the tariffs, mm -hmm. then the only hedge you have is actually to produce more in the United States. And if you talk to the, the German car manufacturers, what they, they do, what do they do is that, well, 
we need to restructure our operations in the United so States. So it's relocation of factories? Yes, but they don't invest more because uh, you know, they, they traditionally also produced their SUVs uh, in, in Spartanburg, let's say, uh, in, in for the Chinese market. And that market is going down, so mm -hmm. it, it's going closed up. So, so there, is, there is two things. So there's procrastination, and then there is investment redirection uh, into large markets where you can hedge, where you can use investment as a hedge. And so in, this, in some, theoretically, you know, the effect on investment is ambiguous, yeah, you, but, but if you look, if you, you know, go through, go through uh, simple models, uh, the, the direct effect, so the effect on pro the progressionation effect is much larger. So it's not good for investment. Yeah. Marcus, want to add something? Sure. Um, so we know that since the United States initiated these tariff wars, the Treasury has collected about 35 or 36 billion dollars in tariff revenue from the special protection. So that's that's a fact. Um, we have uh, economic models that are now coming out where people are trying to model the effects of this, and the results are coming up with, while negative, are not particularly large. And there's reasons to believe that those models are underestimating the effects for two reasons. The first one is the one Olivier spoke about this morning, which is we just have, we have a really hard time capturing in our model fundamental policy uncertainty and hence the impact on investment. So that we know. The second thing, which Olivier didn't mention, is supply chains. Mm -hmm. When Donald uh, Trump was running for president in the summer of 2016, my institution did a project where we tried to model the trade policy proposals of the two major candidates. Um, and in the case of Trump, we took his statements at face value and we were trying to figure out how to model them. We ended up talking to some of our corporate supporters and had some really interesting conversations with them. And, and I'm not gonna name the firm, but we had a conversation with one that went something like this. Okay, if Donald Trump puts a 30% tariff on Mexico, which is what he was threatening to do, and we estimate or we assess that it's not gonna last more than six months, we'll just wait it out, and we'll lose X billion dollars a month. If it's going to last more than six months, then we have to, we have to get out of Mexico. Now, if we're gonna shut down activities in Mexico, where are we gonna start them again? And uh, the, the, the corporate leadership found out they did not understand their own supply chains. To actually make their contingency plans, they had to drill down to the level of individual product line managers. And in the case of this firm, they decided, well, a lot of that production in Mexico would be moved to Singapore. Well, to make room in Singapore, we're going to have to move things out of Singapore. And some of that's going to go to China. Some of it was going to go to Central Europe, I think the Czech Republic. So you had a situation in which a threat, uh, threatened action against Mexico could end up with increased production in Czech Republic. There is no way any economist using a model and publicly available data is gonna come up with that result. And so just, just we know this stuff is bad, we, but our models are not good at capturing some of the f basic channels through which these types of policies operate. Mm -hmm. Okay, both uh, Gabriel and then Carl. Just, yeah. You're totally right, Marcus, uh, but what this does is it uh, gives huge incentives to us economists and, and you know, there's a lot of uh, research now on how to you know, incorporate supply chains into models and, uh, and that's the good thing uh, about Donald Trump. It creates a lot of variance in the data and it creates a lot of things that we thought are not worthwhile investigating and now we think we need really to understand those old fashioned uh, items like <laughs> tariffs, no? So that, that's, the, that's the only positive that I have. Uh, we should give Donald Trump and Boris Johnson the Nobel Prize in Economics for the stimulation of new research. <laughs> They're actually doing good for your profession. Yeah, I, I only wanted to point out the 37 billion that the Treasury collected, they collected from the American consumer. They did not collect it from the Chinese or from anybody. They collect, I, I see your hand movement. I, I know your studies on it. You, you say that there is a benefit because the Chinese uh, lower their prices. And, um, but the fact remains that 37 billion were collected from the um, American consumers. Can I add one, one more thing about investment, international investment? This is not my uh, research area, but uh, as a journalistic kind of uh, uh, opinions from other people, uh, because of the... Uh, Obama's uh, period, mm -hmm. uh, U.S. emphasized so-called remaking America. And also Trump uh, says uh, America first kind mm -hmm. of policies. Mm -hmm. 
providing a lot of incentive to the U.S. companies who are operating abroad, please come back to, to U.S. And has I, that happened? Uh, th th that's what I'm saying. You know, I don't have any statistics uh, about recent years, but mm -hmm. uh, from 2010 to 2016, A.T. Kearney actually mm -hmm. uh, calculated the cumulative uh, numbers. Uh, by that uh, you know, six years period, more than 800 firms returned to, to back to U.S. They are talking about this issue as a so-called reshoring right. rather than foreign investment. Mm -hmm. That could happen. And uh, I visited uh, uh, Taipei before I come here. Mm -hmm. And Taiwan is also doing the same thing. And um, lots of companies who are operating in, in China, they return to Taiwan. But of course, government is providing a lot of incentive. Mm -hmm. So in other words, uh, under this kind of uncertain uh, kind of uh, world trade environment and also government is really pursuing so-called inward-looking you know, trade uh, kind of uh, policies, mm -hmm. then maybe uh, investment will be reduced, uh, which could have gone to other, other, other parts of the world. That's I want to add one thing. Yeah. It's interesting what you were saying about the dismantling of the value chain, because uh, there was a report from the World Bank about last week, actually, asking for more globalization, saying that globalization had been the way to, to take countries out of poverty, and uh, if you start uh, breaking uh, the value chains, uh, you're going to you know, put them back where they were or you're not going to help everybody rising. Do you agree with that uh, opinion? Uh, uh, yes, absolutely. So I, I think the, uh, the multilateral order that we had, let's say, until 2010 or so, mm -hmm. uh, uh, produced convergence. You know? And the period of hyperglobalization, as some say, led to the great convergence. And, uh, um, in a, in a world where power dominates and uh, where international rules are, are no longer taken for granted, can be changed all the time, all the uncertainty, this uh, hurts small countries most. And the largest countries that have big, uniform single markets least. Uh, so it's maybe not a surprise that the country with the largest single market, the United States, is doing this. Uh, but uh, we should expect that it, uh, you know, this breakdown of the multilateral order hurts the poor, smallest countries most to the extent that they are not able to organize themselves. And if you look at initiatives like the African um, continental uh, free trade area, you mm -hmm. know, that, that could counterbalance that. But if that's not going on, then we'll, we'll see, we'll see the, you know, the, this convergence process stopped. And it actually, there's already science for that. Uh, because uh, trade growth is not uh, is, has become very weak. Uh, we are we are not getting the stimulus that from trade to those economies as we used to. Mm -hmm. Carl? Yeah, I wanted to point out that the uh, value chains are of course disturbed by tariffs, but they are also very strongly disturbed by rules of origin. Um, the um, new agreement, um, the USMCA, is one of the examples where yeah. you have rules of origin that I would call uh, perverted. Um, and they have a real effect on also what can be sourced. Um, I had a meeting with Bosch, and Bosch has set up a, a huge um, data center in Vietnam where they want to optimize um, the components that they deliver to uh, um, other um, producers in order to make sure that the rules of origin are met. This is highly complex and is getting more complex. Mm. Yes. Marcus. So one of the characteristics, so Trump is a protectionist, so one of the characteristics of the renegotiation or the negotiations of these trade deals is they move them away from free trade. So in the case of the United States-Korea deal, we moved it away from free trade by extending the periods of uh, uh, liberalization. Uh, in the case of the agreement that we have with Canada and Mexico, uh, we did it through rules of origin and other measures such that we call it NAFTA 0.8 because it's actually pulling you away from free trade. Mm -hmm. um, and you see the same sorts of things uh, going on now uh, with respect to uh, some of these other deals as well. I was wondering, yeah, oh, well, just I'm gonna ask my question, you can answer it right away. Uh, actually, oh, go ahead. I, I go. want to add uh, Carl's point, uh, more specifically, USMCA has a, has a you know, clause saying that uh, if you want to use USMCA, in other words, you have to export uh, automobile uh, by paying no, no tariff, you must produce your output with uh, 35 to 40 percent of the local con uh, content should be produced by the laborers whose hourly income is above $16. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Very, very specific. That right. means Mexican, Mexican hourly wage is very low. Mm -hmm. So you must import uh, from the United States, for example, those parts and components mm -hmm. to produce mm -hmm. something and export back to, to yeah. the United States. So which is yeah. Yeah, a little stupid because mm -hmm. the idea was to raise salaries. Let add a little anecdote from research. I mean, mm -hmm. I've, uh, I, I've done some work on rules of origin. And uh, what we can find there is that but almost always, rules of origin have no real economic justification. I mean, they are usually meant to be there uh, to avoid in, pre in bilateral preferential trade agreements that third countries don't benefit from the trade preferences. Mm -hmm. but, but we know uh, there well, is some... Well, it's a defense but mechanism, isn't yes, it? Yes, but it's, it's most, in most cases, really most cases, there is no danger of the so-called trade deflection anyway, because it's costly to transport goods, and because the tariff structure is not such that it makes this deflection very profitable. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we have outrageous cases of rules of origin, like in the US MCA, that are clearly protectionist, but I would say that almost all rules of origin, these are hundreds of pages, also in EU trade agreements, you know, it's a lot of stuff, and most of it has no uh, rationale, well, the French care a lot about it. You know, wouldn't happen. Yes, I know. Yeah. But it's cheese, protectionist. Our wine, you know, we like to. Yes. Protect well, I mean, there's other. There's the the GIs uh, mm -hmm. that, that protect uh, these 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 uh, food items, but uh, but the point is that uh, the, you know there is a legitimate case for rules of origin mm -hmm. to avoid trade deflection, but there is no economic basis for that. Or very rarely. So what what then remains is really just the protectionist the protectionist mm. uh, element. Uh, and that has been the case for the, for the last 30 years. Now the Trump administration is playing it very hard on that, mm. but it's not, a new, it's not a new feature. The EU knows that quite as well. And if you look at those rules of origin, how detailed they are, you know, this, sometimes it's really ridiculous. And that's true also, for example, in the EU-Korea EU trade mm. agreement. No? It's not something that, that we can blame the current US administration alone. Mm.